Well, good morning and welcome to another teaching. It's a Wednesday morning here in Texas and uh, hopefully all are loving on Jesus, spending time with Jesus. That's the, the meaning of life. It's why we do what we do um, is to, to, to come to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior for the forgiveness of our sins and the salvation of our soul. And then to spend the rest of our lives growing in our relationship with him, growing to know him, right? Not just know about him, but growing to know him and walk with him and fellowship with him, growing in our relationship with him. Um, that's the meaning of, of why we live. So today we're going to continue and uh, finish up John 15. We're going to do verses 20 to 27. It's just, just been good. This entire chapter of John 15, uh, every word is in red. It's uh, They're all the words of Jesus. And it's just, as I said the last few times, it's, it's, it's really remarkable that Jesus is, you know, he's around 10, 12 hours from being crucified. He knows what's coming. He knows that he's going to, to take on the sin of the world. He knows that he's going to experience some type of fracture in his relationship with the father. Um, you remember when he's hanging on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, so he feels forsaken. He feels that his relationship with the father is, is not the same. Again, he feels some sort of fracture clearly. Um, and, and Jesus, when speaking to the father, speaking to God, always says, my father, my father, my father, and yet here when hanging on the cross, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's a, uh, you know, he's about to be tortured to within, you know, an inch of his life. He's going to have a crown of thorns pressed down into his skull. Um, you know, and he's going to be nailed to a cross and have spikes put through his hands and feet. And yet we still have this incredible discourse. He's still serving his disciples and serving us by giving us these words. And uh, Lord Jesus, we just worship you. We thank you and we praise you today. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your love and your mercy toward us, Lord. We just worship you, Jesus. We thank you for becoming a human man for us, living a perfect life for us, dying a perfect death for us. We worship you today, Lord Jesus, our risen Savior. We thank you that you are alive and risen. Father, we thank you for your word. We just thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for your mercy and goodness. Holy Spirit, we ask you to lead us and guide us now as we open your word. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So thank you, Lord Jesus. Um, all right, John 15. Verses 20 to 27. Jesus speaking. Verse 20. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. The disciples were with Jesus. Jesus is has told them plainly that he's he's leaving. Um, you know, he's about to be crucified, as I said, in 10, 12 hours. Um, he'll be raised from the dead two days later. Um, 
you know, it says on the third day because he was in the grave Friday, Saturday, and part of Sunday and, and rose on Sunday, right? Um, and then he was, you know, he revealed himself to his disciples. He was with them 40 days. He ascended to heaven and then he sent the Holy Spirit. And he and he says to them, and, and you know, the Holy Spirit will testify to who Jesus is and what he's done. That's what God, the Holy Spirit does. He testifies to who Jesus is, the Son of God, God the Son. He testifies to his character and he testifies to what Jesus has done and is doing. And Jesus says to the disciples in verse 27, and you also must testify for you have been with me from the beginning. So they were actually with Jesus physically. And, you know, you can't just say, right, May, that, well, the Holy Spirit will do the testifying. The Holy Spirit will testify. He says, no, the Holy Spirit will testify. He says in verse 26, he says in 27, and you also must testify for you have been with me from the beginning. And like the disciples, when we come to Jesus Christ, right? And that's really the beginning of our life. Our life really begins when we come to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Um, you know, for me, it's been around, I don't know, a little over 24 years, I guess. Um, and, you know, I came to Christ when I was somewhere around 28 years old. I'm a little over 52 now. Um, and, you know, from that time, we have a, a, a revelation of Jesus. From the time when we truly understand who Jesus is and understanding, you know, who we are and who we're not, you know, understanding that we are a sinful people. Every human being in the world, all 8 billion people are sinful. Romans 3.23 says everybody has sinned and fall short of God's holy standard. And because of that, we all need a savior. When we come to understand that and we come to to understand and believe that Jesus Christ really is the Son of God. He really is God the Son. He really did come into this world, take on a, a human form, became a human man, lived a perfect, sinless life for us, died a horrible, torturous, sinful death for us, and was raised from the dead, right? When we come to understand that and then receive Jesus as our Savior, right? John 1.12 says that to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Right? Are you trusting and relying on Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins and the salvation of your soul? It's going to be clear here that, you know, it's only in Jesus. And again, going through this entire book of John, we're, we're finishing chapter 15 today. Jesus has made it plain that if out of his own mouth, that if you don't know him, if you haven't received him, if you're not trusting and relying and believing in him for the forgiveness of your sins and the salvation of your soul, you have no understanding whatsoever of who God is. The only way to know God the Father is in and through Jesus Christ, receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And then as a Christian, walking with Jesus, growing to know Jesus, growing to know his love, growing to, growing to love him and obey him is how you grow to know not only Jesus, but God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And he's going to make it clear again, even in these verses. If you look at verse 23, I mean, this is a very powerful verse. We just read it. He who hates me hates my father as well. If you have no taste for Jesus, if you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you have no revelation of the father. Now, if you actually hate Jesus, despise Jesus, then you despise the Father. Here's the reality. Whatever your relationship is with Jesus Christ today is the reality of your relationship with God the Father, good or bad. So if you love Jesus today, 
then you love the Father as well. If you hate Jesus today, then you hate God the Father as well. The point is, all 8 billion people in the world need to, need to come to grips with who Jesus is. And only in coming to know Jesus can you know God in any manner and in any way. Okay? Um, and now as Christians, it's our job, verse 27, and you also must testify. For you have been with me from the beginning. From the time you come to Christ, from the time you've received him as your Lord and Savior, it's your job and my job to testify about Jesus. If you're a Christian today, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. He's one with you. He's one with your spirit. He's given you eternal life. He's given you spiritual life. And the Holy Spirit of God is driving you to testify about Jesus. It is our job not only to live for Jesus Christ, but to speak about him, to testify about him, to talk about Jesus and to speak about what he's done in our lives and how he's done it, right? Um, this testimony of Jesus and about Jesus, not, our, not just our personal testimony of how we came to Christ, but a consistent testimony of how Jesus has been working in our lives and is working in our lives, you know, up until this day. I mean, it's, it's our job to consistently bring up and talk about Jesus. You literally cannot talk about Jesus enough. I mean, as I say it every, every teaching, he's the meaning of life, right? Verse 27, and you also must testify for you have been with me from the beginning. In verse 26, he says, when the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, 27, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. So the spirit of God who lives in you, as a, as a genuine Christian believer today, is driving you to testify about Jesus. Now, most of us as Christians, and none of us do this as we ought to do it, but we we, we consistently resist the Holy Spirit. As believers in Jesus Christ, as Christians and those part of the church, um, you know, we, we, we do not testify about Jesus nearly enough. I'll say maybe, I don't even know what percentage to put on it, but the average believer maybe testifies about Jesus 1% of the time that they ought to, right? And again, just throwing out numbers here, let's say that the, the name of Jesus ought to be on your lips you know what, consistently on a daily basis, right? Um, at some point during the day, you ought to be talking about Jesus, encouraging others in Jesus. And, you know, for the average Christian, you know, they may they may do that maybe, you know, once a week, once a, once a month, you know? So it, it needs to become a habit of ours as believers of testifying about Jesus, just simply talking about Jesus, encouraging others in Jesus. Revelation 12, 11, right? Stephen says they, they overcame, these believers overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, right? It's always Jesus first. We always, any overcoming we do is always by Jesus first, by the blood of the lamb. But it also says by the word of their testimony, which is testifying to what Jesus has done in your life, beginning at salvation, but consistently what he's doing in your life every day by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, just consistently talking about and testifying to what Jesus has done in all the different aspects of your life and all the different circumstances of your life and how he did it, right? And uh, I mean, it's just the privilege of our lives and it's our responsibility to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. You notice he says in verse 26, he, the Holy Spirit, will testify about me. And he says, and you also must testify. So we can't just say, well, Jesus said in verse 26, the Holy Spirit's going to do all the testifying. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> no, he will testify about me, verse 26, verse 27. And you also must testify for you have been with me from the beginning. Father, I ask you to help us. Holy Spirit, I ask you to convict us that we would have a lifestyle an increasing lifestyle of more and more just 
testifying to Jesus, talking about Jesus, thinking about Jesus more and more just in every aspect of our lives. Help us, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, I I got rolling on those last couple of verses first, so I might as well finish verse 26. He says, when the counselor comes, and it's interesting because he says he'll come out from the Father, he'll proceed from the Father, right? But Jesus will send him. Now, now again, look at these, these words in verse 26. When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father. So again, when you slowly read and think about the words of Jesus, just think of the magnitude of these words. He's talking about God the Holy Spirit. Remember, we have a triune God. One God, but represented in three distinct individual persons. Three separate beings, right? All God. God the Father. God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. In verse 26, one of those unique verses that represents every aspect of the Trinity in the one verse, right? Um, when the counselor comes, the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father. So you notice Jesus said, I will send. Again, unless the speaker is God, what is he even saying, right? He just said, that I will send God the Holy Spirit from the Father. So it's clear, it couldn't be more obvious that he himself has to be God because how could he send or command God the Holy Spirit if he himself is not God? That makes sense? When the counselor comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father. So you see this cooperation in the Trinity. Again, it's incredible. You see the sending of the Holy Spirit is a cooperation of God the Son, Jesus, and of God the Father. It's Look at that. Whom the, when the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. So Again, you see the, the Holy Spirit being sent, and the Holy Spirit's been in the world now since Jesus ascended, right? You remember in Acts 1, he ascended, and Acts 2, he clearly sends the Holy Spirit, and, and he's been here for, you know, 2,000 years now, coming up on 2,000 years. It's God, the Holy Spirit, that lives in us as believers and consistently is pointing us to Jesus, and you remember, Jesus said, when you've seen me, he said it in member chapter 14, Philip, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? So the Holy Spirit is consistently pointing us to Jesus, right? Who Jesus is, what he did and what he's doing, right? And clearly what he said, right? All right. Wow. Man, thank you, Lord Jesus. Um, wow. All right. So verse 20. Remember the words I spoke to you. Do you, have a, do you have a habit of remembering the words Jesus spoke to you? He says here in verse 20, remember the words I spoke to you. There's no greater value in your life than remembering the words that Jesus has spoken. Right, Corinne? Do you all have a lifestyle? Do I have a lifestyle? Right? Um in the Bible study we do here, there's so many, uh, you know, there's a lot of them now. Um, you know, some of the guys, but but mostly it's the, the young women that are just uh, that are just getting zealous to just, just they want to read the word of God. They want to be accountable. And, I, you know, I got a few of the guys that are doing it. Good job, Aaron. Good job, Gabe. But we need more of the guys. Right, Benny? We need more of y'all to be really stepping up cash and just studying the word of God. I mean, I, I can't even remember all the girls' names that are doing it. Um, you know, our Bible study has, you know, it's got all people of all ages, but I mean, I don't know, I guess it can go from 14 to, you know, whatever, 60, but, um, um, but yeah, I mean, remember the words I spoke to you, nothing more important than that, right, Becky? Do you have a lifestyle of remembering the word of God? You can't remember 
what Jesus said if you're not spending time in his word. And so he exhorts the disciples, remember the words I spoke to you. He's going to say them again. He said it in chapter 13. No servant is greater than his master. And now he's going to see what he's talking about here. What is he saying? No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. Now, what's, what's ironic is in verse 21, he says, they will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. They didn't really obey the teaching. They didn't, the vast majority of people, certainly the religious leaders, um, for the most part, a few of them did. They did not obey the teaching of Jesus. They should have. And so Jesus is saying basically that, you know, don't be surprised when people don't want to hear what you have to say. Don't obey what you have to say because a servant is not greater to his master, right? Jesus is basically saying, if they didn't listen to me and, and I'm the master, you know, they're not going to listen to you very well either, right? And, and I'll tell you, anyone that's been in Christian leadership, anyone who's had a heart to just share Christ and teach about Christ and get the word of Christ out there, get the gospel out there, try to make disciples, <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's... uh. You know, yeah, I, I mean, the, the majority, the vast majority of people, they don't want it. I mean, being a disciple of Jesus Christ is hard. Becoming a Christian, right? Being forgiven of your sin, right? And um, going to heaven when you die, that's a gift. It's a free gift, right? We're saved from our sin, we go to heaven when we die and we come into relationship with our heavenly father by receiving Jesus Christ. It's a free gift, right? Um, Galatians, I'm sorry, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. So again, going to heaven is, is a gift given to us, right? Uh, by our heavenly father in sending Jesus Christ, right? When you receive Jesus Christ, it's a, it's a gift, right? But now that's how you become a Christian. A disciple now is a disciplined follower of Jesus. It's something different than a Christian. A disciple is someone who's trying to be like Jesus. They're trying to, to follow the example of Jesus, right? Um, you know, they're, they're a student of Jesus. They're an apprentice of Jesus, right? They're trying to emulate Jesus in every aspect of their lives. Um, and when we do that, and when we try to help others grow in their relationship with Jesus and be disciples of Jesus, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, people, it's just the vast majority of even Christians don't want to be disciples, right? Um, again, being a disciple is hard. By no means am I the disciple that I believe that I ought to be. Um, but he says, so when he's saying, no servant is greater than his master, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. You know, that's clear what he means there, right? If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. And basically what he's saying is they really didn't obey my teaching that well, so we ought not be surprised um, you know, when our teaching really isn't obeyed that well. Now, now, hear me when I say this. Just because someone listens to this teaching, right, or someone goes to a church, or you and I go to church and we listen to a, a pastor speak, that's not obeying the teaching of the Word of God, right? You can, you know, a pastor can sit and talk to 5, 10, 20, 100, 500, 1,000, 5,000, 20,000, and just because you listen to it, doesn't mean that you you obey it, right? Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say, right? Uh, Matthew 28, right? 18 to 20, right? Go and make disciples. Well, 18, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, Jesus said. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. You know what he said? Go and make disciples. He didn't say any Christians. Um, but you do have to be a Christian before you can be a disciple. But Jesus wants us to make disciplined followers of Christ. He wants us to, to, to make disciples, right? He didn't say make Christians. He didn't even say make churches. 
If you make disciples, we'll get all that other stuff, right? Go and make disciples of all nations, verse 19, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, right? I believe that's uh, Matthew 28, 19, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Um, and so that's our job as Christian leaders. So very little of that is done in the pulpit, okay? Very little discipleship can happen in a pulpit or on a video, right? That's not where discipleship happens. Here's when we're, we're teaching, right? And, and this needs to be done, of course. This is why we do it. But Jesus said, teach them to obey. So, you know, yes, certainly a part of that happens from the pulpit or here in these teachings when we exhort believers and disciples to obedience, right? Um, Jesus has made it clear in this, in, this, uh, in this chapter that if we love him, we'll obey him in, in chapter 14 as well, right? Really, we show our love to Jesus by, by obeying him. Um, and again, this has nothing to do with our salvation, right? We're saved by what Christ has done. But it's our job as ministers and as Christian leaders to, uh, to teach people to obey the word of God, to obey the scriptures, to grow to be more and more like Jesus. And again, everyone listens nicely, right? Really at church, but that's not, that's not the, you know, that's not how we tell if there's, if someone is obeying us, right? That's why we have accountability. That's why we have discipleship, right? And again, some of that is, is listening to a good, solid Bible-based message, right? That drives home the importance of obedience. Again, if, if, if you're in a church and you're, you're never hearing about the necessity of obedience, again, the necessity of you to, to live your life for Christ, then you want to go somewhere else, all right? Um, obviously, we, we need to understand the grace of God for our salvation, we need to understand that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. There's nothing we do. Our obedience doesn't help save us. But really, the entire Bible, right, the meaning of the scriptures is to first believe in Christ and then to spend our lives growing, growing to obey him, right? So you ought to consistently be hearing about the necessity to live for Christ, to love for Christ, to give for Christ, to forgive for Christ right? You ought, you ought to consistently be hearing that at church. And if you're not, then you need to go somewhere else, right? We do live in a culture where less and less, you know, ministers are less and less willing to, to really just plainly teach the word of God, right? We just, you know, we just quoted Matthew 28, 19, the words of Jesus himself, right? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey, right? And again, everything I commanded. And he says, and in verse 20, and I'll be with you to the end of the age. So again, you don't make disciples in a pulpit, but that's where the foundation ought to be laid, right? There ought to be a foundation of teaching, right? God's people that they need to have a lifestyle of obeying the word of God and repenting when, when they fall short, right? It ought to be a consistent aspect of really every aspect of our teaching. Um, and again, for those who don't understand this, this has nothing to do with salvation. Salvation is the beginning. We come into relationship with Jesus. We're forgiven of our sins. We become God's children. That's the entrance into the kingdom of God. Then we spend the rest of our lives growing to know Jesus, growing to love him, growing to know his love, and growing to obey him. And it's not a religious exercise. It's, we don't, it's not that we have to, we get to do it. And the more we grow in obeying Jesus, the more we'll experience his life and his love. Um, and more we'll just experience the, the, the presence of God in our lives, right? No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also, right? And, and again, that's, that's plain. Jesus was consistently persecuted. And if we are living as disciples of Jesus and testifying about Jesus, you can't expect that people aren't going to want to hear it, right? 
people feel wore out about it, right? And and I say this over and over, it's if we're doing this properly, we are doing it out of love. It's not intolerance, it's not badgering. Um, you know, and, and obviously as Christians, we don't force ourselves on people if you know, but but we do want to consistently walk that line because we love them, because we we want to see them saved from their sin. We want to see them go to heaven. And as Christians, we want to see them be fruitful disciples of Jesus. I'll tell you this. In the last hour of anyone's life, they're not going to wish that you were nicer to them. Everyone is going to wish that you had shared more Jesus with them. Right? I had said that uh, in the last teaching that um, one of our kingdom discipleship family, Stephen had, had lost his brother David. And Stephen had done a, a good job over the last seven years of talking to his brother David about Jesus. But over the last few days, it was certain that Jesus, uh, that Stephen wanted to, wished he had done it more, wished he had done it more, right? Um, so that, that's why we do what we do. We're not, we're not pushing ourselves on anyone, right? But this whole thing is real. Life is real. Death is real, right? And, we, and we've experienced that, as we've said, and we're just asking for the Lord's mercy on Stephen and his family as they go through this, um, particularly his mother, father, and brothers. Um, but, you know, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. They obeyed my teaching, they'll obey yours also. So yes, there are some people that did obey Jesus' teaching, and there are some that, by the mercy and grace of God, there's nothing more satisfying than seeing a disciple grow to know and love Jesus more and more. It's, it's a minister's dream, right? Just to have people grow to know Jesus, grow to receive the teaching of the Word of God, grow to desire Jesus, grow to serve Jesus. As a Christian leader, that's our dream, right? Verse 21, they will treat you this way because of my name. Now he's talking about treat you this way. He's talking about persecution now, right? And not listening to what you say. They will treat you this way because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. If someone is adversarial and contrary to Jesus, they don't know the one who sent Jesus. They don't know God in any manner or in any way. Because it's only in Jesus Christ that we can know God in any manner, in any way. And he said, they will treat you this way. They'll persecute you because of my name. Again, it, the more the name of Jesus is on your lips, the more the, the love of Jesus is in your heart, the more you're walking with Jesus, uh, inevitably, you know, the world won't like it. And even the church won't like it. Because again, the more you walk with Jesus, the more of an example you are and the more the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes on those Christians that aren't walking with them in the same way. Um, and it, it's a horrible thing, right? When we see believers walking with Jesus, we ought to be excited. When we see men and women that are disciples of Jesus and really living for Jesus as you ought to, um, you know, we ought to be excited for them. We ought to be convicted and say, yeah, I want I want to be more like that, right? The Apostle Paul in Philippians 4, 9 said, you know, whatever you've seen in me, whatever you've learned from me, whatever you've received from me, whatever you heard from me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Um, really a remarkable saying, right? Um, you know, uh, Paul said, follow my example, right? As I follow the example of Christ. I think it's 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Um, so we ought to be examples to the church. But, and again, this is certainly something I need to do a much better job with, but the more we, you are an example, the more we are examples, again, the world won't like it, and oftentimes even the church won't like it. Verse 22, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. What is he saying here? Okay. Because the Bible is clear that all humanity 
is born into sin. All of us enter this world with what's called a sinful nature. We're conceived in sin, right? Um, remember when David in uh, Psalm 51 said, surely I was sinful from my mother's womb. I've often told the stories of my, my one-year-old twin daughters, right? Kristen and Lauren, and how, you know, and how you could just see the sinful nature in them at one year old, right? I get them the same toy, identical toy, they're twins. They're both playing with their toy, right? And my daughter Lauren goes, you know, you know, dragging herself, crawling across the carpet, getting up, wobbling over, blah, 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 blah. Picks up Kristen's toy, blah, 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 brings it back. Now she's got two. Kristen's crying because Lauren is taking her toy. And Lauren's just happy as could be because now she's got both. Doesn't mind at all that her Kristen doesn't have any, right? So naturally, I have to go up and pick up the toy and take Kristen's toy away from Lauren, give it back to Kristen. Now Lauren's crying because she don't have both. Who taught them to be like this? They're one year old. No one did, right? And then obviously Kristen had, you know, her sinful ways. We all do. We don't teach our children to be disobedient, right? You know, uh, never, right, did, there, did, uh, did I have to say, be disobedient to daddy, right? And nor does our heavenly father have to say that to us. It's just, uh, it's who we are. We have a nature of sin, a nature of disobedience. And so all of us are sinful, right? All of us are born into sin because of our sinful nature. We're spiritually dead. We come into the world naturally alive with a spirit, with our spirit dead to God. And it's only in Jesus Christ that we can come into spiritual life, that we can be born again, not naturally, but spiritually born, right? You were born naturally. We need to be born again a second time spiritually, right? And that only happens when we receive Jesus Christ. The spirit of Jesus comes and joins himself to our spirit, our dead spirit. And when that happens, our spirit explodes into new life. We have spiritual life and this whole thing starts making sense to us and we start desiring to know Jesus and to be with him and it, it gets exciting, right? Um, so when he says here, if I had not spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. He's not saying they would not have original sin. He, he's not saying here that they wouldn't need a savior. He's saying they, they would not be guilty of this specific sin. Everyone is guilty of sin, right? Um, but Jesus has come to them. He had spoken to these leaders, right? He had showed them who he was. So he gave them his word. And that's enough, right? When you reject the word of God, all of us are guilty from the beginning. But it's a more substantial guilt when you're given the very word of God, the very words of Jesus, and you still reject it, right? Now you've been given every opportunity, right? And again, this is, this is, these are deep concepts I'm going to. Again, all humanity is sinful. Every human being needs Christ. That's why the Christian church has missionaries all over the world to tell people about Jesus. Because no, ignorance of the gospel or ignorance of Jesus or not hearing of Jesus, that doesn't save us. We need a savior. But Jesus has given them his very words, we have the very word of God in the scriptures. And so when we reject that, now you're guilty of even a higher level of sin, so to speak. Does that make sense? If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse, right? Again, we don't have excuse either way. But when, the, when, when you hear the word of God and when you've been exposed to the word of God, and you hear the words of Jesus taught. And for those who listen to these teachings or watch them, and you hear me talk over and over and over, or your pastor at your church or wherever you are, talking about the need of Jesus, yet you, you, you have no excuse. Again, you, we didn't have an excuse before, but now you've been given every opportunity. And to still reject it is, is, a, is a very tenuous position between that individual and God. Verse 23, he who hates me, hates my father as well. So again, you can't say, I reject the words of Jesus, but I hope God brings me into heaven. Because to reject Jesus, 
is to reject God, to reject God the Father. To reject God the Son is to reject God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Again, God the Father sent Jesus. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is convicting the entire world, right, about who Jesus is and what he's done, right, that he is God the Son, that he did come into the world, and that you do need to receive Christ as your Savior, right? And you need to live for him and testify about him. Verse 24, if I had not done, done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father. So you notice, first of all, he says, if I had not come and spoken to them. The first thing is the word of God. Jesus has given us, May, the word of God, Esther. Do you see that? If I had not come and spoken to them, he says first. Okay? So the primary thing we have is the scriptures. We have our Bible, right? There are Bibles all over the world in all the languages. There are missionaries all over the world. All of us have access to this, right? Now, again, um, as I said, ignorance of the gospel is no excuse. Um, and then people will ask all kinds of questions, right? What if, what if it's a baby and a child, right? What if it's, you know, a person who's, you know, um, who's mentally incapacitated or they, you know, um, they, they, they have some type of, you know, um, you know, they're mentally retarded in some way, right? Whatever it is, um, you know, then, then obviously we have to trust the Lord with that, right? We do believe that, that when someone doesn't have the opportunity to comprehend the gospel, like a baby or a child, you know, that's different than just utterly rejecting it. Does that make sense? Um, you know, so, you know, obviously then we trust our heavenly father that he's going to have mercy on these people, right? Um, again, if you're just mentally deficient and you're just unable to comprehend the gospel, or like I said, like, like a baby, um, aborted babies go to heaven, right? Thank you, Lord Jesus. So first of all, it's his word. But now in verse 24, he says, not only had he given him his word, he says, if I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father. So, again, not only did they these people have the word of Christ, which certainly we have all over the world today, but they had the miracles of Christ. And by the way, we have those as well, right here in the scriptures. They saw the miracles. We read about the miracles. When you read the words of Christ, telling you who he is, the Messiah, the Son of God, God the Son. And then when you see the miracles he did, all of that ought to drive us and humble us before Christ and simply acknowledge, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinful person. I know I cannot save myself, Lord. I'm hopeless, I'm desperate, but I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you came and lived a perfect life for me, died a horrible death for me, and I believe you're alive and risen. And I call on you now, Lord, and I ask you, I humble myself and ask you to be the Lord of my life, to save me from my sin, to bring me to heaven when I die. Lord Jesus, I place all my faith and hope and confidence and trust in you alone to save me and to be my everlasting Lord and God. That's how you become a Christian. Romans 10, 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Understand, it's not the words that save you. It's Christ that saves us. But it's our words that we can communicate to Jesus, the sincerity and the genuineness of our heart and our understanding, our need of him and our desperation for him. So again, if you're not sure that you're, you're saved today, if you're not sure that you receive Christ as your savior, John 1, 12 says that to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Go ahead and back up the tape and, you know, again, use the words that I use, but, but keep in mind that the Lord is concerned with the genuineness and the sincerity of your heart. Mm. In verse 25, but this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason, right? And it's just not reasonable, okay? There is no reason to dislike Jesus. There's no reason to not love Jesus. And he's quoting here, I believe it's like Psalm, is it Psalm 69? Maybe verse five or something around there. Um, but he's quoting the scriptures here. They hated me without reason. 
Um, Psalm 69, 4. Okay. Um, they hated me without reason, right? It, there's, there is no reason. There's no rational reason to not love Jesus, to not receive Jesus. Give your life for him today. And if you're a Christian, let's just repent of the areas of our life where we're not living for Christ and begin to live for him and testify for him a little bit more and more each day. Mm. And then we already did 26 and 27. When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify for you have been with me from the beginning. Father, we love you and we bless you and we thank you. We thank you for your word. Father, we do ask you to help us to just have a lifestyle of testifying about Jesus. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you testify to Jesus. Holy Spirit, we ask you to, to continue to sanctify us, drive us closer to Jesus, that we might know him better and live for him more. Lord Jesus, we worship you and we thank you and we praise you. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and your goodness. Lord Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen and amen.